let's talk about what activity models are actually doing and how they work a little bit. So our problem of today is really focusing in on what a different activity of models uh, is assuming about the world and how that informs our choices of what we're going to use it to, to model. So remember, we're trying to describe a real world which doesn't always conform to things like the ideal gas law or ideal solution. And it always, 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 100%, the best way to describe um, a mixture or some sort of chemical situation is to have data about what really happens when you uh, mix these things together and try and boil them or try and measure their volume. Data is our gold standard, but it's not always available. We can't do an experiment about everything. That means we're going to need a model. And I want to back up and do kind of a big picture of all the models we've thought of so far. So back when we were talking almost exclusively about vapor behavior or the behavior of just one chemical at a time, we would start by trying to use the ideal gas law, because that's the simplest model there is really for things. And then when that was ineffective, we would turn to an equation of state. And an equation of state you can think of as being a thing that tells you how far uh, the behavior of a gas is from ideal. Because Z, the thing that you work out when you solve an equation of state, Z is identically one for an ideal gas. And then you could look at Z and see how far away it is from one based on an, uh, an equation of state and know if it makes sense to go back to assuming ideal gas or know really you have to keep using an equation of state. So an equation of state gives you deviations from ideal gas law. Now, when we're working with mixtures, and especially when we're looking at the behavior of liquid mixtures, we know ideal gas is not going to be functional, right? Like ideal gas doesn't talk about liquids. So we know from a starting point, we have to have something that incorporates interactions. So our starting point is often ideal solution. And we talked about that before. And when ideal solution doesn't work, we turn to, or I suggest that we turn to what's called an activity model. And just like an equation of state compactly gives you an idea how far you're deviating from ideal gas, an activity model gives you an idea how far you are deviating from ideal solution. So gamma, the activity coefficient, is one, identically one, for an ideal solution. And then you can look at how far it is from one and get an idea how close you are to ideal solution and if it makes sense to be assuming that, or if no, really, you need to stick with the activity model. I will add parenthetically that A, which is the activity, and again, I'm sorry, there's activity coefficient and activity. They are related to each other. Uh, the activity is the activity coefficient times the mole fraction of whatever your component happens to be. And so when you have an ideal solution, the activity is just the mole fraction. Okay. I do want to note that you can use an equation of state to describe a mixture and liquid behavior. You can do that. Um, it's just uh, not as good in many cases as using an activity model and it's because of how it was built. The equation of state was built to tell us how far things are from an ideal gas, whereas an activity model is built to tell us how far things are from an ideal solution. And once you have a mixture that is changing phase and not behaving as an ideal solution, you already know you are far away from ideal gas, for on the liquid side anyway. So that's why I prefer, and I set up this class to teach, activity models. Um, you will note, if you go look at your textbook, it has a chapter that we skip on how equations of state can be used uh, for modeling mixtures, and if you're totally into it, you could go read it. This is the case for equations of state. There isn't just like one activity model that describes all things ever. In fact, they tend to be specialized to particular kinds of chemicals, particular kinds of mixtures. 
And so I want you to understand what the flavors are of activity models so, to help you choose one. So the two biggest categories that we should think about are empirical and theoretical. And empirical is what empirical is kind of all the time. We go get some data, we run a curve through that data, and then we write an equation for that curve, and there you go, that's your model. So it doesn't give you a lot of insight into how the molecules behave. Um, it doesn't, it isn't built on a whole lot of theory, but it is really accurate with the asterisk that it's only really accurate in the region where that, those data were captured. So kind of like Antoine equation was an uh, equation of state that was purely empirical. Margoul's equation, either one or two parameters, is a uh, empirical activity model. It's really good in the range of where those data were captured and modeled and not so great otherwise. Um, we will tend to use empirical models uh, a lot for by hand calculations because those are the only ones simple enough to just run quickly. On the theoretical side, there is a really deep bench of possible models and they come in three different subcategories. The first is what's called regular solution and its fundamental assumption is that when you mix your chemicals together, they are completely random in their mixing. And that means when you zoom in close and you look at a molecule of A um, and you look at a molecule of B, the other molecules around it are randomly distributed based on the composition. So if it's a 50-50 mix, on average you would expect 50% of the molecules closest to molecule A are going to be Bs and 50% are going to be other As. And in this kind of model, uh, they only consider the interactions between molecules with their nearest neighbors. And so this model is something that is intuitively appealing and is um, relatively simple to write the math for if you're trying to derive it from first principles. It mostly doesn't work very well, honestly. Okay, so you have to do some more reading on this, but that's, that's regular solution. The next step up in complexity is what's called local composition models. And local composition models look at exactly what that says. Uh, if you have something that is non-ideal because A is more attracted to B than it is to A, that means a molecule of A will tend to have more Bs around it when you, uh, when you look at that. And so these sorts of models reflect that assumption. And if you go to graduate school in chemical engineering, you will derive both of these sorts of models, regular solution and local composition, from scratch. And you can learn a lot, uh, gain a lot of insight into the behavior of what molecules do and why by looking through these lenses. And some of the local composition models are quite good and can uh, model a variety of behaviors. It does uh, require that you know something about the interactions between the different molecules so that you could write the model appropriately. Now, um, <laughs> yes, as I said before, uh, fun to write. These are fun to write theoretically. So if uh, you are more concerned with understanding the nature of intermolecular interaction than you are with trying to build this factory right now, um, you can spend a lot of time focusing in on this and gaining a lot of insight about what molecules do. I have one more kind of model to talk to you about, and that'll be on the next page. So this final flavor of activity model is so exciting, it deserves its own page. It's what's called, so it is still a local composition model, but it's called a group contribution method. And you say, what, what does that mean? Well, you've heard of things like this uh, when you took chemistry. If uh, when you were taking chemistry, if they talked about spectroscopy and how you read a, a for example, a, an NMR output about a molecule, and you'd say, well, oh yeah, this signal here is because of this kind of hydrogen, and this signal here is because of this protected uh, component that was in the molecule. Um, this ha builds on a similar idea. So the idea, the concept at, core, at the core heart of this 
is that when we are imagining molecule A and molecule B interacting, we could get the information about how they interact from experiments, um, or we could get the information about how they interact not from experiments on those whole molecules, but by thinking about how the different groups that are part of those molecules might interact in general and with each other. So if you look, I just drew an ethanol on here. If you look at this ethanol, you can think of an ethanol as having, well, there's kind of a methyl group out at this one end, and then at the other end, there's an alcohol group, and probably how those things interact with the world and other molecules uh, can be well described and in fact isolated uh, based on many, many measurements. And then here I'm bringing some water in. Well, water has that, that oxygen with the uh, electrons sticking out the top, so that'll have some sort of interaction. And then it's got the hydrogens at this other end, and they might have another kind of interaction. And so uh, what you do is you make a table of all these possible interactions. And then when you want to say, here is molecule A, here is molecule B, you sum up the different interactions that make up molecule A, you sum them up for molecule B, and then you throw them together and see what happens. And that is the group contribution method. And so what's awesome about this, awesome, 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 is that you could use this on something where as long as experiments have happened to characterize the groups involved, you could do it for a molecule that doesn't exist, but is composed of molecules of groups that are known. Um, that's neat. That means you could use this to actually purpose design molecules. Say you have a uh, something that you know what boiling point you want, um, and you know, for example, what density it's got to have, uh, and there isn't an existing chemical that does that. So you could use uh, this group contribution method to go backwards from a desired result to a potential target molecule. And that's the way folks have gone about uh, designing things, even such as um, potential replacement refrigerants. Um, it's super neat. You need a big computer to pull it off appropriately. Uh, and it still doesn't actually give you the full answer. Um, I know of no molecules that 100% with no experiments at all have been designed straight from a group contribution method right into production. Uh, but we do know of molecules that have gotten close. You know, so like here is a, a bunch of targets for what you might want to try, and people have tried those and refined it and gotten to something good. So this is very cool. And uh, way back when I was a baby chemical engineer, these sorts of uh, models were computationally expensive to use. So that meant it would take hours on the computer, possibly overnight, to uh, run a model using one of these. And that, um, that you know, that was non-trivial. And so therefore, you would hesitate to use them. Uh, nowadays, computers are much faster, and so you use models of this type kind of all the time and benefit from their computational accuracy. Finally, let's talk about today's problem. Now. Uh, in the context of this course, I don't feel that we gain a lot by going into the exact mathematics by hand of complicated activity models. That's why when computing activity by hand, we tend to use something simple like Margoules, and when we are looking at more complicated models, we use Hysis uh, or uh, Aspen properties to do that calculation for us. Thus far, we have been using uh, both activity uh, and even uh, just Raoult's law to look exclusively at phase equilibrium. And in fact, we've been doing a lot of empirical uh, uh, measurements there because we've been using Margoules and doing this. I want to remind you, we can also use these activity models to behave, uh, to describe other aspects of chemical behavior. For example, physical properties, of mixtures. Uh, so if we want to know the density or the volume or the delta H of mixing. And uh, finally, we can also work out our favorite friends, hugs for mixtures based on uh, these activity models. So I thought we'd take a moment 
and turn to our friend Hysis slash Aspen Properties to tell us something uh, about a mixture other than its boiling point. So I would like you to figure out uh, for a mixture of ethanol and water what we expect its volume to be. That makes sense? This sounds deceptively simple. It's actually a bit more complicated than it'll seem on the surface. Uh, we'll get into that right now. So if we have ethanol and we have water and we mix them 50-50 a piece, please predict what volume you expect the resulting mixture to have. And then uh, go through and look at various models and see what volume uh, they predict that mixture will have. And then let's uh, compare it to some data. Let's go get some data here. A couple of things that are important. When I say 50-50 mixture, it should strike you that not all 50-50 mixtures are the same thing as each other. And in fact, there's a wide variety of what that might mean. So let's define 50-50, and I'm gonna actually leave all of the definitions, or at least three of them, on the table. So a 50-50 mixture might mean you start out with, say, 50 milliliters of water and 50 milliliters of ethanol, and pour those two things together. How many milliliters do you have? And that is actually a common industrial measurement of what it would mean to be 50-50. It could also be on the basis of mass. I have 50 grams of water, I have 50 grams of ethanol. Now what happens when I mix them together? And then finally, we are very familiar with moles. So for all of those, let's answer it for all of those. Um, how would you find out? I want you to pick a modeling approach in HISIS and ask this question of it several different times. And then let's compare it with some real data, which uh, we should be able to find both in Perry's handbook and we might be able to do by experiment. 